everyone around me hated and I made I put so much effort in just hating anyone um, basically I can hate after a while um, I didn't hate that way at all when I first joined it was just through that hatred was was like an infection it spread Welcome to a new season of It's About Time. I'm Sadia Zaman. Every week we try to break stereotypes as we experience the human stories of Canada's diverse people. We begin our seventh year with a profile of a young woman on the run. 19-year-old Elise Hadigan has defected from the Heritage Front. That's a Toronto-based neo-Nazi organization that believes in white supremacy. Today you'll hear about the alienation that turned Elise into a racist, the hate that led to her rise in the organization, and the harassment campaign that ultimately forced her to leave. It's one woman's journey of courage and transformation. As a child, Elise Hadigan saw pictures of Canada. She was intrigued by all the people from different parts of the world who live here. She was born in Romania, and her world was white. So when she was 11 and her family moved here to Toronto, Elise thought she would have friends of many different races. It didn't work out that way. When I came to this country, I wanted to make friends of different races, and um, I had even been a supporter of Native rights during the Oka crisis. But uh, I was alone all the time. I didn't have any friends. Um, I couldn't get along with my parents, so uh, basically I didn't, I didn't see any purpose to anything, to any of the things I was doing. I was, I was on my own, <laughs> and I didn't have any goals or any ideals or anything like that. Elise ran away from her parents and her school. She eventually ended up in a group home. When I was 14, I was in that group home and I was, at, at certain periods of time, I was the only white kid there. And because the other kids were of other races, they, they sometimes listened to other music and kind of looked at me differently. And because of that, I just started feeling racist towards them. Those racist feelings were echoed in a TV show Elise saw about a white supremacist group called the Church of the Creator. And so in her loneliness and alienation, she wrote to the group. They told her to call the Heritage Front hotline. The racist feelings that I had felt had been building up. I don't think I was racist and wanting to kill people or anything like that. I think I was just, I didn't know who to talk to about them and I didn't want to be criticized. I called the hotline a few times. There were a lot of messages about immigration, about white rights. I never heard people talk like that before. I thought I was the only one with um, racist views, so I, I really needed to talk to somebody about it. And uh, finally, I did leave a message on the hotline and somebody called me back. This is the man who called her back. Wolfgang Droge is the leader of the Heritage Front. He's an ex-convict who once tried to overthrow a Caribbean country. His hotline blamed minorities for crime. He's an immigrant who used the hotline to promote hatred against other immigrants, the ones that aren't white. Elise didn't see the contradictions. She saw a friend. He didn't blame me at all for anything. He, he made me seem like I was the greatest person for having contacted them. Um, that was so um, racially conscious as opposed to other kids who are running around with minorities. Uh, he made it seem, he made everything seem so great. Um, he blamed everyone else. He blamed uh, everyone who wasn't white on uh, the creating the problems in this country. He blamed the fact that I didn't have a job on the fact that there was affirmative action. Uh, so basically, I don't know, I, he empowered me. <laughs> 
He also gave Elise something she had never had, a sense of belonging. During those first few months, they gave me a lot of self-esteem, which I didn't have before. And uh, they constantly complimented me on just about everything. And they made me feel like they were just my family. I felt like I belonged, and I felt like I couldn't be without them, that they were there for me, and they were my family, and I couldn't see not being with them. Surrounded by her new family, Elise soon began to adopt new values. She prepared herself for a race war and became a passionate promoter of white supremacy. I knew that I wanted to be um, involved in the race war that was just coming up ahead and uh, I wanted to kill as many non-whites as possible so that, uh, you know, in the end, uh, the white race would survive. It was my duty as a white woman to help save the white race as uh, the <laughs> since the Heritage Front was um, in a fight for survival. So then uh, I did whatever they felt was necessary to be done. Set up there, everywhere. And the former communist Elise police recruited new members, she recorded messages on the hotline, and she system. made speeches. I personally visited Romania last year, and from what I've heard from people, I can only tell you to monitor the news very closely because when the Germans decide to ship those gypsies back to Romania, all hell's going to break loose. <laughs> the compliments and the applause were addictive, and Elise couldn't get enough. I was so hooked on, on the Heritage Front. They were the only thing there for me. I felt that I would never belong anywhere but in the organization. I, the idea of leaving the group never occurred to me. Um, I was basically there for life, and I built my whole future around them. Elise even got military training to prepare for the race war. And while still a teenager, she got a license to buy a gun. They showed me how to work a gun. But do you think you could have ever used it? Yes, definitely. I was willing to. Elise was rewarded for her loyalty. As the youngest female member of the organization, she was paraded in front of the media as a spokesperson. To the outside world, she gave the Heritage Front a softer image, even a progressive one. But on the inside, things were very different. As time went by, I started noticing that they looked down on, on me just because I was a woman. And uh, I noticed also that during important, important political discussions, the males would be in one room and the females would be in another with the children trading cooking recipes. And I would never take that. I would always go with the males. And because of that, sometimes I was resented. And uh, then I started sticking up for uh, women's rights, and I was being put down for that as well. Elise also realized the new family had a new set of expectations. The men in the organization wanted her to behave the way they thought a woman should. Elise was only 16. The pressure was tremendous. They started dropping hints to dress a different way. They wanted me to dress sexier, uh, to dress more like a woman. They wanted me to wear tighter jeans and, uh, I don't know, lower cut tops and uh, basically there were two reasons for it probably one was that I would be when I was recruiting I would be more appealing to the males and the other probably just so that I looked better to the media they didn't even like my voice they wanted my voice to be a lower pitch and because I also did phone work and uh, they, they basically wanted me to play games with the male potential recruits so that I would get them in they thought that women were put on this earth basically to procreate that the the duty of the Aryan woman was to bear as many Aryan children as possible because our race was on the brink of extension. So they wanted me to basically settle down and have as many kids as possible. Um, they put a lot of a lot of pressure on my personal life. They they wanted me to go out with men in the organization and basically they thought it wasn't natural for me not to want to do that. 
Around the same time, the Heritage Front launched a harassment campaign against anti-racists. Most of the people targeted were women. They called them up, they tried to discourage them from coming to rallies, they threatened them, they threatened their families, they called them at work, they tried to get them fired, they followed them, they watched their houses. They basically started a terror campaign. As part of the harassment campaign, the Heritage Front distributed this flyer. It targets a local woman fighting against racism. It lists her home number and address. The woman got threatening phone calls day and night, and someone also painted a swastika on her house. There was something in me, I don't know what it was, that kept me from going over the edge. Um, when, when I started harassing people, I wasn't as into it as I wanted to be, as I thought I should be. Um, and then as I started talking to one individual in particular um, who was on the anti-racist side and who I was supposed to be harassing, things started changing. I just started thinking that it wasn't right. Elise gave a copy of this flyer to another woman activist. Elise wanted her to warn the woman targeted by the flyer about the harassment campaign. It was an unusual act by a dedicated racist. I was going behind the Heritage Front's back in order to warn the anti-racist community that a fa about a, f a woman on their side being uh, harassed. And uh, I can't figure out why I did it. I think it was, in a way, I was getting back at the front for, doing, uh, for putting all that pressure on me to be the typical right-wing woman. And uh, I just felt sorry for this young individual who had done nothing wrong. And that's the first time I ever did that, and I was, I never thought that it would get back to them. <laughs> but it did. The woman who Elise gave the flyer to told the police. Sometime later, Elise was arrested and charged with libel and promoting hatred. The Heritage Front closed in to make sure Elise didn't talk to the police. After I got arrested over a flyer that had been put out by the leadership, and the fact that I couldn't tell anyone who had made those flyers and the fact that the Heritage Front leadership had approached me to and pressured me to plead guilty and take the rap. I, I realized that I was expendable. I realized that, um, you know, they were willing to use me to cover up for their own. Elise also believed the people she called her family had betrayed her. She wanted out but she didn't know how. And so, in desperation, she tried to kill herself. They didn't chain me, so I know I could have left, but psychologically and emotionally, I was so attached to them that I know I could not have left on my own. So, uh, invisible chains, I guess. Uh, I don't think I could have left, I really don't. So there was no choice? There was no choice, as far as I'm concerned. I basically thought that the only way I could get out was either if I went to jail or died and uh, I don't know either way I just didn't see a way out the suicide attempt put Elise in the hospital from there she secretly called the same woman who had reported her to the police she was desperate for a friend and found one that friendship not only helped Elise decide to leave the front but also to do it in a way that would help people fighting against racism it didn't make sense to me that I should just leave. I had all these secrets and all this information. I wasn't going to take it with me. Uh, I wasn't going to carry their baggage with me, so I wanted to tell somebody. And before that, um, I'll... Uh, that somebody was Martin Therio from the Canadian Centre for Racism and Prejudice. Elise told him she was willing to spy on the front. To be honest with you, I didn't believe it. Uh, my first attitude was, it's probably a plant by the Heritage Front to access information on organizations and the anti-racism movement here in Toronto. So I don't think that our first meeting was that, that nice for her because I had a lot of questions and I worked under the assumption that she was not for real. It was a tenuous beginning. For months, Elise spied on the Heritage Front. Martin double-checked the information she was handing over. It was a dangerous game. Uh, there was one member that they suspected here in Toronto that worked for an anti-racist group, and they kidnapped him and uh, tortured him. Uh, 
for six hours. At this point in time. And they only thought that he had uh, leaked information to the anti racist side. Well, a lot of people say that what I did was a brave thing to do. Um, I don't look at it as that because what I did before that wasn't brave at all. The idea that I had of Elise the first time I met her was rather, I would say, uh, accurate in terms of someone that was a believer in the movement, the, I mean, the neo-Nazi movement. Uh, but for the first time, she was opening up and, I would say, like getting closer to her own feelings and her, her own self. And I think seeing more and more of the contradiction between the human being and the believer in the neo-Nazi movement. The most energy was just after included. four months of I spying, so many, Elise so had had enough. There, everyone around me hated, and I made I put so much effort in just hating anyone. Um, basically, I can hate after a while. Um, I didn't hate that way at all when I first joined. It was just through that hatred was was like an infection. It spread. Um, I don't know, talking to other people who hate it as much, it kind of rubbed off on me and learning that reading the literature, which was made to, uh, made to be so real, it was just an unbelievable waste of energy. There was no doubt in my mind that she was changing. Uh, and I did never expected her to come out and say to me, I'm not a racist. Because if she would have said that to me, I would have said, fine and probably would have moved on. You would have been suspicious. I would have never believed anybody like uh, who had been for so many years in a racist organization to come out of the blue and say, I change, I'm not a racist. When I left, it was just the, the most wonderful day. Tell me about that day. Um, well, it, I, I can't describe it. It was, uh, I knew it was finally all gonna come out in the open and um, it was like I was being born again. It really was. Uh, it was. I was a new person. I mean, I still didn't know who I was because my whole belief system had just completely shattered, and I, I, I had no idea what I was going to do in the future. But at least I knew that I was getting away from death, which is what they were to me. I think that uh, the most Im important uh, misconception that she had, and she believed that, was that white people were being discriminated in society. And the one doing it were all the minorities controlled by the, uh, by the Jews. And that's basically the bottom line uh, ideological framework of neo-Nazism in Canada. And I think that was that painted all of her beliefs, all of her approach, how, how she would read issues in the press, how she would view uh, the review of a film, how she would look even at the Oscar ceremony, for instance. I mean, everything is tainted through this ideology. I can't believe that I used to think that people, just because their skin shade was a, just a shade darker, should, should be exterminated. What was the first thing that went through your mind when we first met? Uh, what did you see when I walked in the door? I saw a human being and I saw a woman, but to tell you the truth, I really didn't take your skin color into consideration. and That's amazing for me, uh, you know, looking back and thinking at how I was just a year ago. I, I don't hate anymore. I'm not a racist, I can say that. Um, there's a lot of things that I still need to work out. Um, basically, I mean, I can't, feel, I can't feel any of that hatred anymore, but sometimes I have instant reactions. I, I have flashbacks sometimes. Um, so I think it will take a little bit more. But um, I can tell you right now that I'm not the same person I was. And uh, I think with time, I, I can just get over those last few things. It's not only her old belief system Elise is challenging. She's also dealing with regrets, memories of people she has hurt. This person walked by, and he seemed to all of us to be a gay man because of what he was wearing. And he stopped and he turned to us and he started talking and criticizing us and saying that what we were doing was wrong. And I felt that I had almost caused him to be gay bashed because I started talking back to him and I started moving towards him in a threatening manner. And then the, the other people who were around me, they started doing that as well. And we all uh, surrounded him and um, he, we were going to hurt him and uh, he left. What would you say to those people if you, if you had a chance now? 
I like to talk to them and explain to them that, yes, what I did was of my free will. I wasn't brainwashed, but I don't know. I would like to apologize to them. Today, with Martin's help, Elise is speaking out when she can. She has even testified against the Heritage Front. I had contributed to the Heritage Front a lot, and I needed to contribute to reality as well. I needed to make people see who they were, and what better way to do that than have a former Heritage Front spokesperson speak out against them. You asked me if it's a scary thing, uh, thinking about myself way back then. Um, the only thing that's scary about it is I know the person I was then would kill the person I am now. Um, other than that, I just see it as a fact, I mean, of how easily manipulated or just, uh, you know, kids can, can be. Um, you know, some, some join, they might not even be racist when they join. Some, some might just be interested in the clothes or the fashion or the music. And uh, because the music is racist and uh, the following um, is racist as well, I don't know, it just, it grows. When you have a group like the Heritage Front, or the Ku Klux Klan, or any of those white supremacists, because there's about 50 of those across the country, that comes forward and say to these young people, your plan is being shut down because there is two reasons for it. One of them is the fact that we're sending all of our money to Africa. This money should come back to Canada. Secondly, because of affirmative action programs, you can get a job anywhere because it's only the minorities and the women and the handicapped and the native that gets the job. And if you're 18 and 19 year old and you don't know what's going on in, in, the, in the world and you don't see any future for yourself, these are very interesting answers to your questions. They can come from all backgrounds and they can come from all walks of life and they, you know, they're not going to wear you know, the, their clan robes out in the open and they're not going to wear their SS tattoos out. Um, they're ordinary people. They could be your neighbor. Um, they could be anyone. And you're not going to know um, you know, the things that they truly believe in until you're already in the organization. They're going to be very nice and they're just going to tell you that they're, you know, you have, you have a choice. But um, especially for young kids, after you join, you really don't have much of a choice anymore. You just go with the flow and the flow is going towards destruction. Today's paper brings some good news. The charges against Elise for promoting hatred have been dropped. Her personal life is uncertain, though. She's estranged from her mother, and her father has died. Are we the new family? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think I have a family right now, and I don't think I would trust anyone that, that much again. Um, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm on my own. I have good friends that I can count on, um, so they're kind of... Um, a background for me, but I, I don't. I don't look at anyone or any organization as in them being my leader or them being my family. We want her to be herself. We don't want her to be dependent on the family for the rest of her life, or the way you put it. What we want is to at least to find herself into this process, to come to grips with what she wants to do, and we'll provide her with help and support to, in order to achieve the goals and objectives that she would come up with. But we will definitely not be in a position or wanted to start organizing her life or her belief. It's up to her. These days, Elise lives on the run and relies on volunteers from across the country for shelter. Many belong to the groups she used to hate, gays and lesbians, Jews and people of color. Elise tries to keep her life as normal as possible, but it's not easy. How do I protect myself? Um, just take basic precautions, you know, just watch my back and, you know, sometimes I don't answer the phone or don't answer the door or just, you know, just watch myself, that's all. I mean, that's all I can do. Do you ever fear for your life? I used to. Right now I'm at the point where it just doesn't matter anymore. Um, I, I have been running from them, and uh, I just basically, I have to stop. I have to basically build a normal life. So I'm not, I'm not going to lead my life as you know, being intimidated by them. So I think 
one day it'll happen, and I'm gonna try to work at it. Um, and I can't say that I'm gonna let them stop me. I hope you've enjoyed the first show in this, our seventh season. Next week on It's About Time, we'll take you on another personal journey. You'll meet a Chinese-Canadian man who, as an adult, has to learn to like his own race and culture. See you next week. I'm Sadia Zaman.